Hello and welcome to the Irish Film London podcast, your fortnightly catch up on what's happening in the world of Irish film. Stay tuned for the latest Irish film news and interviews with some of the best names the Irish film industry has to offer. I'm Neve Brannigan and I'm joined by Jerry Maguire. How are you this week, Jerry? I'm very well, Neve. Thanks. What do you think? New intro? Yeah, I like it. Okay. Let's, do it. <laughs> Let's use it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, in this week's episode, we'll be sharing Jerry's interview with Emily Watson, Tony O'Rourke and Shane Crowley from our St. Patrick's Weekend preview of the new drama, God's Creatures. How did the weekend go, Jerry? The weekend went really well, yeah. So God's Creatures was one of five things that we showed last weekend. Uh, we were literally all across London and it was a bit of a bit of a hectic time for us. But it Yeah, was good, you don't yeah. make life easy on yourself, you guys, the, the IFL team for sure, being so spread out across the, the city. We push ourselves a little bit, yeah, but it's, <laughs> it was worth it. We were in Riverside Studios in Hammersmith on Friday night for Lakelands. That was great fun. We hooked it up to the Killen in Kilburn then for Clouded Reveries with Kira Cormick and Sharon Woolley. Saturday we were in the Garden Cinema in Covent Garden for a screening of eight shorts. God's Creatures was Saturday night and it was Anne Colling Kuhn up in the London Irish Centre on Sunday. Most shows were sold out. It was really good fun. Um, yeah, I guess I should say thanks to everyone who came out, came out and supported us and enjoyed those events with us. Yeah, we're kind of kind of in rap mode now at the minute. From that's mm. like at the last of our three festivals from November, February, and March. So we've got a big gap now before we go back into festival mode in November. But we're not resting on our laurels. There's some more screenings coming up this summer. And the first of those have been announced. We've got some screenings of North Circular happening across the country in late April and May. The first of those dates are on sale around the country now. So we're at the Tyneside Cinema in Newcastle on Friday 28th of April, Glasgow Film Theatre on Saturday the 29th, and the Cameo in Edinburgh on Sunday the 30th. Luke McManus, the director of North Circular, is going to be doing a Q&A at all of those. So if you know anyone in uh, Newcastle, Glasgow or Edinburgh, you've got to let them know about that. You can just head over to irishfilmlondon.com forward slash events to find the ticket links there or look up the cinema website for each city. Tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. And yeah, we'll see you all, see you all there. Amazing. We're, we're, we're going on tour again. We're, we're, we're spreading ourselves. So that's really, really cool that um that more people will get to see Irish films I feel like it was probably a special night with people watching on Colleen Kuhn because I feel like it's hard to find over in over in London whereas it's in like every cinema here you know yeah there's less and less screenings of it on the big screens now what was really nice about The Quiet Girl was it was in the community centre it was in the the, the Irish centre in Camden where like a lot of people have come across and taken part in the services that they offer like passport services and housing and you know crisis management stuff for the community if if, if it comes to that uh, and it's a bit of a, a hub so the audience there was like it was all our people in a way mm. you know um it feels kind of funny to say that but um yeah it was it was a good event that was an absolutely packed out house so oh, amazing very very cool so latest in Irish film news I guess is we had the Oscars um, since I was talking to you last and a gorgeous gorgeous win of the night was best short for an Irish goodbye and just what a special moment that was I feel I mean especially the sing song that occurred I, it's not an Irish it's not an Irish event if there isn't a sing song so the fact that they the lads got the whole place to uh, to sing happy birthday was so so special it was gorgeous it was just a lovely little moment and like those guys deserved the win in mm. so many ways definitely definitely and then another win that we had as well was Richard Bainham for Avatar also a gorgeous acceptance speech with opening with Garamila Mahogut which is always nice to hear in Hollywood yeah we love it we love to hear it mm -hmm. and overall though the Oscar is not as entertaining as uh, I mean no one got assaulted which is always nice but not as you know it was fairly <laughs> straightforward um, Jenny the donkey did also make uh, an appearance which was lovely to see I think Colin Farrell looked like he was going to cry he's so in love with Jenny the uh, the donkey 
Yeah, but like, I guess disappointing that the Banshees team didn't pick up any awards on mm. the night Well, because they were obviously with so many nominations, the expectation was that they'd come away with some statuettes or something. But yeah, slightly disappointing that they didn't didn't pick up any gongs or any awards or anything. Yeah, but, of course. I mean, everything, everywhere, all at once just absolutely cleaned up, really, didn't it? Yeah. And I think that, they, like, it's great to see that it did win. Like, I was really kind of rooting for Michelle Yeoh in a way as well. Yeah. And for, and for the rest of that team, it's really cool to see that film recognised. It's one of the older entries as well. Like, it's one mm-hmm. that came out the longest ago, so it's good to see it being recognised. Um, mm-hmm. It's so funny to be talking about the Oscars, like, in the past tense now, because I feel like we focused on them so much this year but Mm -hmm. I'm kind of kind of ready to let them go now and talk about talk about the industry in a non-awards focused way you know but other big news which is very cool is that Paul Mescal and Barry Keown are confirmed for the Gladiator sequel I mean does it get any better? That's pretty good news I mean it's pretty exciting news like you know when we were talking earlier in the year in, in these news sections about the power that Paul Mescal has to just kind of appear in a big film and take over the world. Mm-hmm. Like, this is this is that film. Like, mm-hmm. to be in a big Ridley Scott historical epic, you know? I mean, I, I think there's not very many details about that film, but he's basically playing, like, the son of Russell Crowe's character. Mad. You know? I think he's really... He seems to be really, really pushing... Um, just trying to show us how versatile he can be like I know he's right. in that new film Carmen which is um, yes it's a, like it's like an, a ballet opera right Carmen right. is yeah he's just like have you seen the trailer for it he's mm. just dancing around all over the place and it's just yeah, like it looks another, incredible very, another very thing even. that he could do right yeah, very impressive. I mean, that's, you know, and sometimes you can really respect some actors who kind of stay in their wheelhouse and, you know, they're good at what they do and, and they do it well. So it's always, I think, really interesting to see actors just pushing and pushing and pushing themselves to yeah. do, show us, you know, how much that they can do. Because, I mean, that's that's half the reason why you do it, you know, is to play different characters and to explore different worlds and, and everything. So that's really cool to, yeah. that, I feel like we're just going to see him in so many different lights, which is yeah. cool. Nodding um, vigorously in agreement with that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but loads of new Irish productions that will be coming down the line. So we'll be covering all of them in more detail, of course, in due course. But for people who didn't get to catch some of the St. Patrick's Day events, uh, they can find some of the shorts online, right? That's right. So the short film selection from St. Patrick's Weekend is still available on Irish Film From Home until the end of March. So head over to irishfilmlondon.com forward slash Irish Film From Home and grab a ticket wherever you are in the world. You can watch those short films until the end of March. Amazing. I think it's really, really cool that we really try and bring our podcast audience and our festival going audiences together and show them both what we can what we bring um one being this week's interview which was your live q a and um, for god's creatures and just an advance warning um for the listeners uh, there is a lot of spoilers in this um which comes up um but it will be released in ireland today and the uk on the 30th of march so if you don't want to hear any spoilers Go and see the film and then come back to us and listen to the Q&A. Brilliant stuff. All right, well, let's jump into the interview. If you're part of the regular Irish Film London audience or want to get more from your experience, consider joining our growing family of members for a range of exciting benefits. Irish Film London is a non-for-profit organisation. Our mission is to promote the best new Irish films to audiences all over the UK and with the help of this podcast, the world. If you become a festival friend or a festival champion, you get perks like discounted tickets for films and events, free access to Irish Film from Home films, and invites to networking events and so much more. So check it out now. Another way of supporting IFL is heading over to our Ko-fi donation page, which you can find at ko-fi.com forward slash IFL podcast where you can chuck us the price of a cup of coffee, or even better, a pint. If you value what we do and think, I'd like to buy these guys a cup of coffee if I meet them, well, now you can. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, so, my guests 
I was going to say the guests need no introduction, but I've already introduced them at the start. But yeah, um, if you could please welcome back to the stage Emily Watson, Tony O'Rourke, and Shane Crowley. <laughs> so um, I hope that everyone enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed it. Um, a gorgeous film. Um, Shane joined us sort of at the last minute, and it's really, but it's really good to have you here, Shane, because it means that I can kind of start off with like a uh, a question about the genesis of the project and and ask you about your involvement as screenwriter and um, yeah, how it came about. Um, it came about uh, with me working in a, uh, a restaurant in Killarney, and my friend Fola, uh, who's the producer of this, was nominated for an Oscar for a short film that she made. She was producing. And she was looking at coming up with this slate of projects uh, and she pitched this idea to me uh, about uh, this oyster fishing family because her family are oyster farmers. You know, we, we both grew up in the same environment in County Kerry um, where the kind of film is set. So, yeah, she pitched that to me when I was, you know, serving plates to people. I did like I had no experience in writing, really. So it was a bit of a leap of faith. So that was in 2013. Wrote that script, which was more like a family drama. But then, uh, yeah, over like um, the course of eight years, we kind of layered it up, uh, you know, into, into the kind of more, you know, yeah, the, not political piece that it is now, but yeah, I suppose, yeah, it took a long time, like, of development. Yeah, and at what point did um, Anna and Celia, Celia? Uh, yeah, they came on in 2018, I think, so when we had the kind of, um, this, the genesis of this idea about the mother who lies to protect her son, uh we had that kind of, yeah, we were looking at, you know, there was things happening at home that we wanted to reflect in Kerry, like these kind of instances of cultures, uh, that, you know, choosing to defend uh, the assailant in sexual assault cases rather than uh, the victim and, yeah, re-victimizing them really to a certain extent. And we being adults and having a relationship with that world were very uncomfortable with that and ashamed of it. So we thought we wanted to, uh, yeah, investigate that and the story that we had about these uh, oyster farmers. So when we started doing that, we got funding from Screen Ireland um, that allowed us to kind of, yeah, commit to it. And then when we got that script ready, Anna and Celia read it, um, and, yeah, I think they said they both sat together and read it in one sitting, and immediately, you know, they were our directors. So, like, yeah. Brilliant. Um, it's like many projects that are coming out of Ireland right now. It's set in a gorgeous landscape and, you know, it makes great use of the the place that it's in. Um, Emily, what was it like to be shooting when, in this, like, windswept place in Ireland? Well, we shot this film during COVID, so we were... We had the coast of Donegal pretty much to ourselves, which was an extraordinary experience. Um, it was... It's a hypnotic, magnetic place, as I'm sure you know. Um, and uh, it was a huge part of the work that I did to become completely sort of sucked into it. Um, yeah, it was. It's an. It's a very powerful part of the world. Yeah, I, I feel like the landscape that it's set in lends itself so well to the tone of the story and the way that the characters respond to it is almost like like I imagine many people that really live there, they're sort of shaped by the, the roughness of it and so on. I mean it it's where you, you know, but but, but for, for my, for the, sense, the sense that I had it is that the men live by this, you know from the sea mm. and it's very dangerous work and that the women live at the edge and support them and you know, do all the um, facilitating of, you know, of, of, of their catches and process everything, but they also do all the other stuff as well. Um, and it's a very um, hierarchical and patriarchal place in that way, although although Aileen is a, is a true matriarch, she is very strong. Um, but it's, it's, it's a place with sort of ancient, ancient baked-in structures of intergenerational violence that's never talked about and um you know and i think you know probably within this audience this speaks to many women's lived experience in some way 
and this is, you know, I think these two directors and, and Shane and Fola as storytellers are, are, you know, let's keep shining the light, let's examine this is a religious structure here that is has rallied round and supports a rapist. What's wrong with that picture? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a... Uh, but yes, you're, you're right, the sea is absolutely yeah. at the front and centre of that. Mm. I, I kind of went off point there. <laughs> no, but thank you for doing so. Um, because it, I do want to ask you about, um, about your character mm -hmm. and about, um, like, becoming a... Becoming a character like that is like it, it's such a there. There's so many aspects of that mother figure mm -hmm. that are familiar to me as a a man who grew up in Ireland with an Irish mammy, you know. <laughs> but right. there's um you know there's so much of it that's captured in such an authentic way. Um, yeah. so I'm I'm curious to ask you about the the character building sort of side of your. Um, I think. Yes, I mean, as you can hear, I'm a nice middle-class English girl. Um, I have a very slightly nasally, heady, slightly annoying voice. Um, and um, it's a long, it felt like a very long journey. It was a script that I read and went, oh, you know, it felt incredibly authentic, but it didn't feel like I, a world that I knew at all, and it felt I had a long way to go. I, had, I worked with a dialect coach, Neil Swain, who was, you know, and we worked, I learnt it like a nursery rhyme very, very, very meticulously. And you feel your centre of, gravi of gravity kind of shifting without you realising in that process. But it also was partly to do with the landscape because Aileen is an animal, really. She's very... Uh, she, 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 you know, she's like a... A cat, and she will swipe, um, and and you know the scene where she lies. It's so instinctual and so immediate. Yeah, it's she doesn't think twice about it. She knows that she has to, she has to say what she says in that moment. Mm. There's no two th things about it. Whereas Tony, your character is almost like the moral compass of everything that's going on. You're a little bit removed from the action because you're a new mother and. You sort of every any time I, I see you on screen, you're talking so much sense into everyone. And <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I think for me, the first time we meet Erin, she's the first person that brings up consent mm -hmm. for me, and that is related in what she says about not teaching your sons how to fish, swim. to swim, <laughs> because they fish. Thank you. And I find that really that was actually something I didn't know about, which is, um, d does that still happen today? Or is that a... Yeah, they do teach fishermen not to swim because they're less likely to jump in and risk their lives at the surface than someone else. Yes. So that, for me, was fascinating. And I feel we have the same ideology when it comes to teaching our children consent, in particular our boys. We are afraid that if we talk to them about sex or even introduce the idea of what consent is we'll be putting ideas in their head in the same way that we're terrified to teach these these men to swim in case that they will ever actually need it and Aaron sits down and goes well that's bullshit and I'm not going to do that and the first thing I'm going to do is teach this small boy to swim and I think that's her first act of defiance and as we learn or at least through rehearsals with Shane and our two gorgeous directors, we spoke about what is Erin's past to get her to that point of speaking the truth, it, what I would also say, yes, the sense in that moment, that moral compass that's going, that's not the truth, though, Mum. We don't know what Brian has done, but what we do know is that he wasn't with you that night. Yeah. That's such a core part of the story though isn't it like the the idea of I suppose the the, the idea of God's creatures and Shane I suppose I'll throw this back to you is, is it's about um, well I, for me I, I'm going to probably st stumble through this quite a bit but um, I think it's 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 about the length that you'll go to to 
to protect a loved one before your morality kicks in or your, your ethics kick in. And there's there's loads of little clues that you've dropped in the script to let us know the kind of character that Brian is. I love there's a part where he comes in from a day's work and drops all his work clothes in the in the hallway and Eileen has to come and pick them up for him afterwards and it's just so telling about the kind of like the nature of, of the relationship that they have. Yeah, well, that's such like an Irish mammy thing, I think. Uh, is, yeah. You know, I, like I'm one of three brothers and I hate to shame them, but they did that so much. Uh, they were de desperate. Um, but yeah, I would, maybe I'd look at it a little bit differently rather than it being uh, about, you know, necessarily being about, you know, the maternal instinct to protect your son and understanding that. It's actually a story about... For me, sometimes when I, when, I, when I think about it, like, and this might sound stupid because, you know, I, we wrote the thing and we worked on it for so long, but it's actually justice denied for Sarah and why that happens. Um, and so, like, there's a very intentional pivot at the end where you're, you're in her perspective because it's actually been her story all along. Um, but it's made by the lie that Aileen tells instinctually. She takes the potential for justice uh, and... Yeah, that like what might have been the circumstance that Sarah would have wanted, you know, in pursuing Brian, Aileen denied her that. So it's just like we were interested, that's what we were interested in was the why of that, the how of that. And yeah, that and like that's why, you know, we focus on the cultural aspect of, you know, the, the community and stuff, because that informs Aileen's decision, who she is and the, and the, and the town and like, yeah. So it, 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 it's about, for me, yeah, for me, it's the justice denied to Sarah and how that happens and why that happens. Yeah. Um, it, obviously, uh, Ashleen and Paul aren't here with us this evening, but, I mean, their performances are brilliant. Um, and, yeah, I think that more and more as you get through the story, it becomes obvious that it's about Sarah and the way that the film finishes on a sort of a long shot on her, it really makes it more about her. Um I suppose I'm going to ask you all a question about um, Ashleen and Paul and working alongside them in, in absentia. Um, yeah, anyone want to share any thoughts? Uh, they're great. Um, <laughs> yeah, they were like, I, everyone probably thinks Paul is like uh, this naturally gifted person who just falls into roles. He absolutely, like he is gifted, but he doesn't fall into roles, but he embraced this character uh, that is a very dark, you know, player you know uh that probably goes against the grain of what he's done before like he came and visited us at the height of his uh normal people fame uh, in 2020 and would follow the 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 um the producer's brother john michael went you know working on the, the oyster farms and like got his hands dirty so like yeah they were just very generous uh people i think and collaborators like yeah i think yeah yeah both extremely gifted i mean i love how ashling is so um her stillness and her strength are I'd like you know it's like a sort of humming magnet at the center of the film yeah and paul amazing i mean such a you know a real actor's actor proper proper diligent inquiring humble you know everything you'd want him to be which is which was really a pleasure to work with mm -hmm. And this one as well. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, I, I've i known Paul for years, so that was actually just really fun uh, to be working with a pal. But the morning that I left London to head to Donegal to do a film with Emily Watson, I was in the back of the car. <laughs> um, freaking out. And I was like, oh my God, this is mad. Uh, and I opened my phone and I had a message saying, hi, Tony, um, you don't know me. My name is Ashley Francesi. I absolutely know who she was. Um, but she was like, we're going to be working together. And I just wanted to say hello. And I was like, what? and I just knew in that moment that wherever I was going, I would be held. And that has stayed true. And she's now one of my best pals. And we're uh, they, they, the, Our first day all together, after we'd, be, we'd been in isolation for a week, everybody in different places rehearsing on Zoom. And the two of the, these two girls, I thought they'd known each other since birth. <laughs> they were like a pair of seagulls. Yes. yes. <laughs> Very hyper seeing each other in the flesh. Because it had been a week of like speaking in isolation yeah. and 
we'd done FaceTimes, myself, Paul, and um, Ashton. We did, Ellen actually got on those FaceTimes by the end of it. I got you on those a couple of times. But before that, obviously, I wasn't calling Emily Watson on FaceTime. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were in isolation. So, when we all did get together. We were just squealing for the whole day. <laughs> and how long did you all spend together in this, like, sort of COVID uh, shooting environment? In it was nine weeks. Yeah, longest I've ever been away from my family. Oh. Yeah, it was very, very intense for that reason. Yeah. Wow, that's, I can't imagine it. I've, I I didn't do any production during the whole, like, COVID period, but so uh, I only hear stories about it, but it's, it does sound like a really intense period for, for all that kind of stuff. Um, as I like to always do uh, when I run out of my own questions, I would like to um, give everyone in the audience an opportunity to ask their own questions. I think, although I can't see very well, that we've got a roving mic somewhere. Yes, I can kind of see it at the back. Um, does anyone have a question? There's one down at the front. Uh, oh, can you wait for the mic so we can... Thank you, so we can make sure everyone can hear. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> um, second row. White cardigan, thank you. Thanks, Abby. Hi there, I'm Paul uh, Cooney. Very Irish name, hopefully you agree with that. Um, no, I just wanted to say it felt so much more Irish than another recent film based on the sea. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say it felt more sort of real Irish. I know that did very well, but I just wanted to, um, yeah, just share that with you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Paul. Pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, I think I did see another hand um, go up just back there, and I'm going to slightly favour this side of the audience because I can't see you all over here. Uh, thanks, Abby. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for a wonderful film. Um, I would. I was interested in uh, the the two directors. How did that work? Well, why did you decide that you were going to have that there would be two directors, uh, and how did it work, um, and um, logistically, uh, as well as in in storytelling and working with the actors? They come as a package. I mean, they are joined at the hip, inseparable, um, and it was amazing. Actually, it was really, really amazing. They're incredibly so cool. These two young women from New York. They're very, very quiet and very, very powerful. They don't say a lot. Um, they had the Irish crew absolutely eating out of their hand. Mm -hmm. And they would, you know, I don't know what everybody's idea of a film set is like, but this is how they would say, could I trouble you to move the chair? Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was, the way they worked with everyone, it was absolutely beautiful and full of respect and very much based in the ethos of what this film is. Um, um, but they would go, after a we did a take, one would go to camera, one would go to the actors, and there'd be a little bit of whispering, and and then we did go again. But it was never the same one. They were absolutely interchangeable in what they... Yeah, it was remarkable, actually. That's a very good question, and thank you for asking it, because um, in, in, in having you all here and... Um, being a little bit sort of nervous to be sat next to Emily Watson. Um, I have sort of glossed over the idea that um, that Anna and Celia um, are, are such a huge part of this project as well. Um, yes. Uh, they work really closely on the script as well, like as in we brought them in at a point, uh, you know, where we needed, like, yeah, the director's voice. And like, yeah, I went over to New York and spent 10 days with them. They came to Ireland for like three weeks as well, uh, and just got to know and feel the place. Uh, so yeah, they really dived into it. Like they were, they were on the project for three years before they shot it. Like so, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. Long time. Um, thank you. Um, <coughs> can we get a mic across there? I, I have a mic. So thank you. Thank you for the film. It's really interesting. Um, I just wanted to find out um, about. I'm more interested in the culture and how. In a patriarchal society such as that one, women often collude in their own downfall, but they're not aware that they're doing that. And I'm just wondering if these sorts of films are shown within that culture and if these kind of discussions are being had around um, things like um, consent. Film opens in Ireland, 
Yeah, today, next week. I think, or next uh, week. Today, week, uh, yeah, Friday, or the 24th. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, and that's probably, I mean, for me, being from Kerry and that part of the world, that I do love, like, it's like, I'm very proud of the fact that it's going there and to get people to go out and watch it. Because it is, I hope that they're getting comfortable uh, and it gets people talking and it creates conversations in pubs, uh, in homes and stuff like that. Because, like, yeah, I was home uh, there. To, I live in Edinburgh and I had to fly from Edinburgh to Kerry, from Kerry to London to get here because of the trains. Uh, <laughs> but And I happened to read the front of the paper, the local paper, and there was something very similar again, like, uh, like a historic case. Um, but, and thank God, like... Thank God that the woman pursued uh, and, you know, got her justice and, yeah, like, so like, I, I think th things are changing. Um, and it, I'm very proud of the fact that this is hopefully going to make people uncomfortable back there. Um, I'm afraid of going back there, but, yeah. <laughs> Fair play. And thank you. That's a very insightful question. Um, do we have any more? There's one over here. Thank you. Sorry, I am really struggling to see you all. Thanks. Emily, I'm going to ask you. Um, Hello, Majida. Hello. <laughs> um, actually, I wanted to ask, there's a real sense of foreboding in the film all the way through, and I think a lot of it is played out on your face. Um, and one of the things, I've actually watched it the second time now, and actually I noticed how much um, was revealed very early on um, in terms of the tension and your unease when Paul uh, Bryan first walks into the scene. How do you decide how much to reveal when? So I guess it's a question about process. Very good question. Very good, um, thank you. I think we worked, all of us together, with Celia and Anna and Shane um, and Fola on, on a very clear sense of what exactly had happened in the family prior to this story, so that it was there had been some kind of violent incident between father and son and he'd left um, and that he had been always the apple of my eye and always in a way too much loved and and had always felt that he would he could do anything and um, he could abuse that relationship so in a sense all that is there but she doesn't want to ask too many questions she doesn't want to crack open the lid because then everything might fall apart again so it, it, it felt like walking a tightrope of um, I don't know I don't know I don't know how I've just got one of those faces that shows stuff I don't know really um, yeah you just do all that work and hopefully it's it, it's also about how they look at you um, it's about the you know the camera and that Celia and Anna had very clearly, you know, with, with Shane and Fola, they'd thought, thought very profoundly about every single moment before we got to this. So there wasn't ever any, um, uh, you know, there wasn't any doubt. There was, it was very clear, even though we weren't talking about stuff because these are communities that don't talk about stuff and that's half the problem, it was very clear what was going on underneath there's a sense within that dynamic between um, Alien and, Paul and uh, Brian that that there's a lot of trust. Well, there's an issue around trust, perhaps, between the two of them. That, like, you, your character is desperate to trust him and can't let go of It's that. almost like I just really want him to be my friend. Right. I want him to love me. I want him to stay. I want him because he lights my life up. He makes me feel, mm. you know, alive. Mm. And I don't want to do anything to jeopardise that. Yeah. Yeah. There's something very maternal about that instinct. There's something very off, you know, isn't right. it? It's very I, off. Yeah. And very true to mother and sons, yeah. I would say. And quite, yeah off an odd relationship to witness on screen and frustrating when you're sitting there as the daughter going ah, <laughs> I'm here yeah yeah that I showed the film very early on before it was finished to my own daughter and her favorite scene was when um Erin says you know it, it, the world's not turned upside down it's always been like that it's just you're the one that's turning mm. yeah 
I, I, again, I think that her, uh, the character of Aaron is so insightful to tell us where we are in the, in the story. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, I think we can do another question, and I can see a hand up in the middle. Um, if anyone has a mic. Thanks, Madeline. I have a question. Um, I know that they said that the men, the fishermen, aren't taught to swim. Um, do you think your character was able to swim and would have been able to save Brian at, at the end had she wanted to? That's a really good question. Um, I think she probably, yes, she can swim. Um, and this is, you know, this is one of the one of the points where I went into a very big conversation with Celia and Anna because when I first read the screenplay, it was how how does a, you know I'm a mother? How do you get to that place? And we talked a lot about the, it's a sort of bookended. At the very beginning, when he first appears, she's just been cradling the baby, and it's she sings to it, and it's like a prayer of, I, you know, I wish my son was here. Please come, I, my son. And she opens her eyes, and he is standing there. And it's like it's he he becomes her faith, in a way. And so at that moment at the end, when she realizes that he is about to drown she in a good catholic way lets god decide <laughs> um and it's a sort of moral framework that's really weird but she sort of it's like another prayer it's like i'm i'm just going to see what transpires i mean you know what she should have done is not gone out to sea with him she should have gone down to the garden and said I lied. But there we go. Brilliant. Um, we've got time for more? Yeah, cool. Let's do some more. Um, let's there, I want to go for the one at the back who's had their hand up the longest. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Can you put the hand up again? In the middle-ish. Thanks, Abby. You're probably closer. Uh, thank you. It was uh, a really beautiful film, uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. I, I wanted to ask, you, you see very early on and throughout the film a lot of religious motifs. I think within about the first 30 seconds or with a minute, you see Mary and, and you see a lot of crosses throughout the film. And Emily in particular, you... Paul O'Brien is, is almost the prodigal son and, and your relationship with him... It's very interesting, and I wanted to ask how you felt that those religious connotations uh, influenced how you developed that character. Well, I think, you know, it's... I think that that's really, really interesting, and I think it's really at the heart of it, because if you pay lip service to that moral framework, you don't have to actually be a moral person. You know, they go to the blessing of the boats, they go to mass, they, do, you know, they say all the right things and they have all the iconography in their homes, but they don't, they defend a rapist. And, you know, there's a huge kind of pulsating question at the center of that, which is, where is the church on the question of sexual assault? Where, where is the commandment? You know, doesn't exist. Yeah. It's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that there's... there Actually, just to draw on that a little bit, the religious iconography, which I think is very specific, even even more so to the coastal community, is like such a such a heavy Gothic influence in the in the story. And it's it's a huge part of the tone of the film. Um, Shane, was that always there in the script, or is that something that Anna and Celia have brought to it? Uh, yeah, no, that was there. Uh, I think when you grow up uh, visiting your aunts and your uncles, uh, and like, there's just this constant uh, barrage of, like, just yeah, crosses and Jesus and Mary and babies, um, <laughs> and you don't know. I mean, I didn't know how to respond to it other than with. Incredul incredulity uh, as a kid I just you know I never just it never seeped into me it seeped into one or two of my brothers but um, yeah no, it was always in my head 
and like when I when I was writing it, that was on the page, hundred percent. Yeah, there's probably a, a, other things that were there as well. Um, yeah, it was. It feels like it's kind of part of the fabric of rural Irish life more so than just yeah, like Irish life in those red lights above the door with the cross and it's like out there in every house oh, yeah. Um, yeah. they never need to be replaced yeah. no <laughs> there's no battery right. in there no <laughs> Jesus it's always Christ, red man, yeah. <laughs> but it is really interesting when you hear it culturally when people are like there's crosses and I'm like oh I wouldn't have even got that it's just like going to your aunt and uncle's house you wake and up in the middle of the night and to get a glass of water and you're like oh Jesus so Christ so. <laughs> oh my god but Anna and Celia, who are from um, who are stateside, it, a big question was when is it set? And I just find it so funny because they were like, "You guys are so obsessed with this. Like, it's clearly now. Like, they, that's this is the island they see. Whereas we're like this years ago. But going to the countryside, Ireland, you would see that set and that energy and yeah. No, um, to give you a frame of reference for that, my sister who lives in Ireland would never dream of having a sacred heart thing in the house. My mum and dad have two. <laughs> so. <laughs> and they live up the road for each other in Ireland today. So. Yeah. Um, well, I, have a, I have a question at the front, um, which Abby can get you a mic for. Thank you. I've been to Donegal, and it is physically beautiful place and, uh, and magnetic. But to be honest, we haven't seen much of the physical beauty of Donegal, but we saw the magnetism. And just as well, because we had the facial expressions of some of the actors to concentrate on. Was it on purpose that you didn't concentrate so much on nature and the beauty of nature? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think earlier you were talking about how the environment uh, yeah, it reflects the nature of these people's lives, yeah, and, like, the excuse that that gives them for acting the way they do. So to, like, yeah, portray that, you show, you know, yeah, like, the clouds, the rain, you know, the spit of the sea against the rocks and stuff like that. Like, that's the island I know. Like, do you know, the the postcard images, I mean, I don't know that. In, I, in Kerry, there's 190 days of rain every year. Um, so, like, yeah. I mean, I wanted to show that in film, you know, um, so yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, I've got one question at the very front. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, for first, first of all. Hopefully I'm going to speak my question in the way I mean to. Um, first off, the religious thing is really interesting because I didn't notice half of it and I realised it's just, I'm a recovering Catholic. That was, that's normal, isn't it? So, and my question in, originally was going to be, so why didn't, why wasn't there more religion? But of course there is, it's just baked in and that's the whole point. My actual question though, I don't want to be one of those, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, did you have anything in mind in terms of consciously avoiding cliches where Irish is spelt with an O, for instance? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. I I mean, that probably is something that we just did anyway. Like, do you know what I mean? I don't think, could I be a cliche or could I be more of a cliche the way I, like, do you know what I mean? Uh, so it just came out the way it, like, I mean, that might sound really trite, but it yeah, just I came out the way, I mean, the way I am and the way Fall is and the way LNC are as well and the way they kind of absorb the... It's yeah. real rather than for the tourists. I think so, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, Got one question at the back, Jerry. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed the film. And just to link back to, I think, the, the setting uh, point, I wanted to ask a question in relation to the time in which the movie is set, which seems to be around the year 2000, given some of the number plates in Kerry. Um, and I just wanted to ask, were there specific factors that informed your choice of time? Um, and whether or not you think a film set in the current day might uh, might reflect on the theme a bit differently? Yeah, it probably would, because like I do think that like when for start probably the Catholicism and the religiosity of the community isn't as extravagant anymore, um, and also like economically the 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 the, the Ireland changed drastically in the 2000s 
and every every small village and town was uh, changed utterly by that. So it, I think we made the decision to set it before the boom years of the Celtic Ireland uh, and like you know, Brian was coming back into the world before that happened, I, th I thought it was important. Um, or we thought, it was, oh, sorry, it was important. Um, so yeah, it's set in, in and around 2000. I won't say any more than that, as you can see by the, the number plates. And it's pre-phones, internet, exactly. having sort of changed everything. Mm, in terms of being able to deal with an issue like yeah, that? Yeah. Just being, not being isolated. Yes, very good, very good. Um, well, it won't, the film won't be in isolation much longer. Um, because it's out in Ireland on the 24th and it's out here in the UK on March the 31st, so two weeks from today. Um, but it's been on a huge journey already. It was at Cannes last year and it's been at loads of festivals and events and stuff in the meantime. Um, what's it been like going on the journey with the film? It's been really interesting, actually. It's, it's, you know, it's a film that provokes a conversation um, and it's been interesting how that conversation is reflected differently in different places. Yeah. Um, well, we hope that the conversation can continue and that all of you will go and have conversations about the film and tell everyone what you think about it. Um, it's out in two weeks' time, so tell your friends and tell your friends to tell friends. Um, and on your way out tonight, we are going to ask you to tell us what you thought of the event tonight on feedback forms so my lovely volunteer team will ask you to fill in feedback forms or scan QR codes please tell us what you think as well um, can I say thank you to uh, Picture House Central and um, Jill and Julie and everyone at the BFI for helping facilitate this event tonight um, to all of you for coming and sharing your Saturday evening with us and to my brilliant guests Emily Watson, Tony O'Rourke and Shane Crowley thank you very much Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. And that's it for this week's interview. Thank you all so much for listening. We hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you to Culture Ireland and the Irish Emigrant Support Programme. Myself and Jerry will be back in a fortnight with a brand new interview. See you then.